away for the recording. At this point, you should have your notes out and you should be ready to record the lesson of today's title, which is Evolution of Cells. You should also acknowledge that today is November 10th, 2020, and it is Unit 8, Day 2. By the end of today, you all will be able to describe how cells evolved from anaerobic prokaryotes to eukaryotes. And the essential question that we seek to answer today, how did multicellular organisms evolve? How did multicellular organisms evolve? So I will leave this on the screen for 30 seconds as you all wrap up and uh, get ready to, to take some notes. Shouldn't take too long today. Mr. Ray, what is the yeah. date? What is the date of our appointment again? Thursday. Thursday. Um, what day? Twelfth. Yes. Um, from three o'clock, right? Let's see. <clears throat> yes, three o'clock. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, can we change it to three thirty? Yes, that would actually probably be better yeah. for me. Okay, be better. All right. All right. Okay. So let's play this quick Kahoot. I know there were, before we play the Kahoot action, let me go over some stuff from yesterday. It seemed like you all needed a little more clarity. So we talked about these eight levels of classification. These levels of classification allow us to practice what's called taxonomy, which is basically the study of how things are organized, how organisms are organized. We can organize them in very general ways, general descriptions that describe quite a few organisms. For example, we can describe the animal kingdom the animal kingdom describes all animals, but we can get more specific than that. We can get more specific and describe, for example, uh, the family hominids, which, in, which, in, which includes humans, which includes uh, chimpanzees, which includes gorillas, which includes uh, a number of other species that have opposable thumbs and collarbones. Okay, so, but it doesn't include insects, it doesn't include birds. So as we get more specific, we're including fewer and fewer organisms, all the way until we get to the species level in which we're talking about only one type of organism. So for example, the domain eukarya includes both plants and animals, but the kingdom, the animal kingdom doesn't include plants. Now we can get more specific than that and talk about the mammalia phylum. The mammalia phylum doesn't include birds or reptiles or amphibians. Even though they're all animals, they're all in the same animal kingdom. The mammalia phylum does not include those other organisms. Then we can get more specific than that and talk about a specific class in the mammalia kingdom. 
And then we can get more specific than that and talk about a specific order in that class and so on and so forth. All right, so um, this really allows us to specify and talk about specific organisms, or we can just talk more generally about uh, a larger class of organisms that might share one or two characteristics in common. For example, all mammals have mammary glands. That means that they can produce milk for their offspring. All organisms in the chordata phylum have backbones. So that would include humans as well, but that also includes fish and birds and reptiles and amphibians. Okay, there's another phylum that's also in the animal kingdom that includes organisms that don't have backbones like insects. And then there's another phylum that's also in the animal kingdom that includes other organisms that don't have bones at all, like jellyfish. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you, you guys have to be aware of these different levels of classification. I know maybe that was a little confusing yesterday, but this Kahoot will hopefully help a bit. Can I move on now, Jaden? All right, so here, here, here's, here are those eight levels of classification for humans. However, it makes more sense to use the scientific name. The scientific name uses what's called binomial nomenclature, which means that it just uses two, that's what bi means, two names. That's what nomial means. Nomial is from the Latin for name. So binomial means uh, two names. And those two names are the genus and the species. The genus and the species. They are the two most specific levels of classification. The way we write that, we write the genus first. We write the species second. We capitalize the first letter of the genus, and then we italicize the whole thing. Italicize means, of course, to write it in that slanted format. So genus comes first, species comes second. Capitalize the first letter of the genus, and italicize the whole thing. That's what we call the scientific name. That's, that's the binomial nomenclature. So we can do that with any species on Earth. Any species on Earth has, has those, that binomial nomenclature. Now, keep in mind that two organisms that are in the same class must also be in the same phylum, and they must also be in the same kingdom, and they must also be in the same domain. But they're not necessarily in the same order. So let me put it like this. Two organisms that are both mammals are definitely both also organisms with backbones. For example, uh, two organisms that are mammals might be a human being and a whale. Both a human being and a whale have backbones, so they're both in the same phylum. They're both animals, so they're both in the same kingdom. And they're both eukarya, so they're in the same domain. But just because they're in the same class, they're both mammals, doesn't necessarily mean that they are in the same order. Humans are in the primate order because humans have collarbones and the ability to grasp things with fingers. Of course, whales do not have fingers, nor do they have collarbones. So they are not in the primate order. Okay, so just because two organisms are in the same class doesn't mean they're in the same order or in the same family or in the same genus or the same species. But if they're in the same class, then they have to be in the same phylum, kingdom, and domain. If, if two organisms are in the same family, they have to be in the same order, class, phylum, kingdom, and domain. 
we've got to think about this as kind of larger umbrellas. Put it like this. If you go to school in Charlotte, that means that you go to school in North Carolina. And that also means that you go to school in the United States of America. And that also means that you go to school in North America. And that also means you go to school on planet Earth. But if you go to school in Charlotte, that doesn't necessarily mean that you go to West Mac. You could go to East Mac. You could go to Garinger. You could go to Providence. You might be in elementary school. You might be in college. So just because I say someone is in school in Charlotte doesn't mean that they go to West Mac. But it does mean they go to school in North Carolina. Right. So I can kind of zoom out and be more general and still be stating facts about that person. But if I zoom in, then I'm not necessarily telling facts about that person. Same thing with these organisms. If I have a primate, I can zoom out and say that that primate is in the mammal class. And I can zoom out further and say that that primate is a chordate. And I can zoom out further and say that that primate is an animal. But I can't zoom in any further than that. I can't say that the primate is a hominid. That primate might be a gorilla. I can't zoom in any further and say that that primate is a homo sapien. That, that, that primate might be a chimpanzee. I can't specify. All I know is that they are a primate. Okay, so hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Um, we'll talk about the dichotomous keys if we have to and the phylogenetic trees. Let's try this Kahoot. So you're going to go to www. Oops, www. Kahoot. Can't spell today. Kahoot. It. The game code is seven eight three eight one one six seven eight three eight one one six.
let's take about 30 seconds to join the game, 30 more seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and start. Why do scientists organize living things into groups? Good. All right, so that the organisms are easier to study, yes. So we can classify them as having shared characteristics and also so that we can explore their evolutionary relationships to one another. That's, the, that's really a big part. Excellent job, Ayana. And I think AJ is Aaron and Jessica and Nick and Chelsea. All right, what is binomial nomenclature? What is binomial nomenclature? All right, so binomial means two, and the, the root word nomial means name. So binomial means a two-part name. A cat's scientific name is Felix Domesticus. Which genus does it belong to? Okay, so let's let's take a step back here, folks. 
I really, really need you all to take some good notes here because that should be, based on everything that I just said, that should have been an easy one. Okay, hold on. The scientific name includes the genus and the species. The genus comes first. Remember I said that, right? The genus is written first. You capitalize the genus, you write the species after it, and then you italicize the whole thing. So in these scientific names, the genus is always going to be the first word. Good job, Alyssa and Fanique and Kesley. What is taxonomy? Good. An organism's scientific name consists of, just said this, just said it. I need everybody to get this right. Scientific names are blank because they consist of two words. Two words. Scientific names are, again, binomial because they consist of two words. Come on, folks. Come on, let's pick it up, pick it up. The lowest hierarchy level, meaning most specific. What's the most specific level in biological classification? Good, species is the most specific level. Alyssa is running away with it now. If two organisms are in the same phylum, they must also be in the same. All right, so this was what I was just explaining, right? If we zoom in, if, we're, if we become more specific, we can't necessarily say that those two organisms are in the same class or family or species. Just because they're in the same phylum doesn't mean they're in the same class, family, or species. But they have to be in the same kingdom if they're in the same phylum. It's kind of, I, I see why that's a little difficult, but. Amarillo, ¿qué pasó? 
Okay. Now this one's tough. So we're told that this organism is Deerus magnus. Meaning we have to now work backwards to figure out the traits of Deerus magnus. That's what these dichotomous keys allow us to do. Sometimes you will be shown a picture of an organism, so you'll know what its traits are, and then you'll have to work to figure out what the species name is, what the scientific name is. Again, these are scientific names because we've got the genus written first, and then we've got the species name. All right. So in this case, we're not given traits. We're given the name, the scientific name, and we have to figure out the traits. We're told Deerus Magnus. So here it is right here. Deerus Magnus does not have a tail. Now, this is question set three or statement set three. So now I need to go back up and figure out which statement led me to statement set three. Here's that statement right here, has four legs. From has four legs, that's when I knew to go to step three. Okay, now I need to figure out which statement led me to statement set two, which is where has four legs is. So then I go back up here, has green colored body. So that's how I figured out that Deerus Magnus does not have a tail, it has four legs, and it has a green colored body. Okay. Good job, Nick. Which organism is the youngest according to the phylogenetic tree? Which organism evolved last? Good job. All right, let's see. Okay, good job, Alyssa. Eight out of 10 is excellent. Nick and Fanique, good job to you all as well. Let's go back to the slides. Jump to today's notes. All right, so today, again, we're talking about evolution. I do want you to write down this statement. Earth first started as a hot primordial soup consisting of little oxygen and lots of carbon dioxide. So I'm gonna pause as you all write down that statement. That's pretty foundational for this lesson.
Okay. So a long time ago, this image, of course, is an artist rendition, rendition but this image is, a, is an accurate representation of what Earth would have looked like not long after it was formed. <clears throat> it was an extremely hot planet. It was a planet where the atmosphere was made up largely of carbon dioxide. It was a planet that was uh, covered by a lot of water. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. there was no life anywhere on the planet. Question, Anthony? No, sir. Okay. It was also a volcanic planet. It was a planet where methane clouds often caused uh, to rain acid and to, uh, there, were, there were many thunder and lightning storms. So this was not a safe place. Um, this was not a place that was conducive to light, or to life, I'm sorry. Um, the, the energy from the sun was extremely dangerous because there was no ozone yet. There was no ozone that could shield life from the dangerous UV radiation. So essentially, this was not a fun place to be. And the life that eventually came out of this existed underwater for reasons that we are about to understand. Now the question is, how do we know that this is what Earth was like? And how can we anticipate that this is how Earth came to be? Uh oh what happened to my video? Okay, well, one way we do this is by running experiments. And one particular experiment was extremely important to us. That experiment was run by two scientists, well, really one scientist named Stanley Miller, who was working in a lab at the University of Chicago, uh, he was able to demonstrate that the early conditions of the Earth, which of course were not conducive to life initially, eventually became conducive to life. They created this experiment that allowed us to simulate what early Earth would have been like, where it was very hot, there was a lot of water, and there were some basic gases. And together, those uh, gases, when they were you know, exposed to electrical sparks, uh, those gases could be incorporated into the water and eventually lead to the building blocks for life. Okay, so please do write down those, these two bullet points on this slide and then we'll watch the video. Okay.
Um, if you knew that, if you know that you joined the call late, please send a message to the chat because I see that we've got more people here, but I just don't know who came late and I don't want to mess up your attendance. All right, let's watch this video though. I'll watch it over here. Billions of years ago, on the young planet Earth, simple organic compounds assembled into more complex coalitions that could grow and reproduce. They were the very first life on Earth, and they gave rise to every one of the billions of species that have inhabited our planet since. At the time, Earth was almost completely devoid of what we'd recognize as a suitable environment for living things. The young planet had widespread volcanic activity and an atmosphere that created hostile conditions. So where on Earth could life begin? To begin the search for the cradle of life, it's important to first understand the basic necessities for any life form. Elements and compounds essential to life include hydrogen, methane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, phosphates, and ammonia. In order for these ingredients to co-mingle and react with each other, they need a liquid solvent, water. And in order to grow and reproduce, all life needs a source of energy. Life forms are divided into two camps, autotrophs, like plants, that generate their own energy, and heterotrophs, like animals, that consume other organisms for energy. The first life form wouldn't have had other organisms to consume, of course, so it must have been an autotroph, generating energy either from the sun or from chemical gradients. So what locations meet these criteria? Places on land or close to the surface of the ocean have the advantage of access to sunlight. But at the time when life began, the UV radiation on Earth's surface was likely too harsh for life to survive there. One setting offers protection from this radiation and an alternative energy source. The hydrothermal vents that wind across the ocean floor, covered by kilometers of seawater and bathed in complete darkness. A hydrothermal vent is a fissure in the Earth's crust where seawater seeps into magma chambers and is ejected back out at high temperatures, along with a rich slurry of minerals and simple chemical compounds. Energy is particularly concentrated at the steep chemical gradients of hydrothermal vents. There's another line of evidence that points to hydrothermal vents, the last universal common ancestor of life, or LUCA for short. LUCA wasn't the first life form, but it's as far back as we can trace. Even so, we don't actually know what LUCA looked like. There's no LUCA fossil, no modern-day LUCA still around. Instead, scientists identified genes that are commonly found in species across all three domains of life that exist today. Since these genes are shared across species and domains, they must have been inherited from a common ancestor. These shared genes tell us that LUCA lived in a hot, oxygen-free place and harvested energy from a chemical gradient, like the ones at hydrothermal vents. There are two kinds of hydrothermal vent, black smokers and white smokers. Black smokers release acidic, carbon dioxide-rich water heated to hundreds of degrees Celsius and packed with sulfur, iron, copper, and other metals essential to life. But scientists now believe that black smokers were too hot for LUCA, so now the top candidates for the cradle of life are white smokers. Among the white smokers, a field of hydrothermal vents on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge called Lost City has become the most favored candidate for the cradle of life. The seawater expelled here is highly alkaline and lacks carbon dioxide, 
but is rich in methane and offers more hospitable temperatures. Adjacent black smokers may have contributed the carbon dioxide necessary for life to evolve at Lost City, giving it all the components to support the first organisms that radiated into the incredible diversity of life on Earth today. Did you know that a single-celled organism caused the first mass extinction? Check out this animation about how it almost wiped out life on Earth and paved the way for complex life. Okay, so let's watch another video about the Miller Ure experiment, which demonstrated many of the things that they just mentioned in that video. During the holidays, we were able to get a lot of really awesome food from the mobile pantry. The day before Thanksgiving, there was turkey and potatoes and a pumpkin pie. Stated Clearly presents What was the Miller-Urey experiment? It was once believed that if you left food out to rot, living creatures like maggots and even rats would simply poof into existence. The idea was called spontaneous generation. A series of experiments starting in the 1600s disproved this idea, and in the 1800s, a new scientific law was proposed. Life only comes from life. It's true that rats, maggots, and even microbes are far too complex to simply poof into existence, but in 1859, English naturalist Charles Darwin put forth the theory of evolution. In it, he showed that under the right circumstances, relatively simple creatures can gradually give rise to more complex creatures. Given this information, serious thinkers began to wonder, is it possible that simple life forms actually could come from non-living matter, not by poofing into existence, but through a natural gradual process similar to what we see in biological evolution? Darwin himself mentioned this idea when writing to a friend, but if, and oh, what a big if, he wrote, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, and so on present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. In 1924, Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin published a book which he titled The Origin of Life. In it, he outlined his thoughts on a gradual progression from simple chemistry to living cells. He imagined the early ocean as a primordial soup, a rich collection of complex molecules produced by natural chemical reactions. In this soup, further reactions could take place, eventually producing living cells. At the time, Darwin's warm little pond and Oparin's primordial soup were really just speculation. They were founded on a good understanding of chemistry and biology, but they could not be considered legitimate scientific hypotheses because no one had found a way to test or observe them. Science, after all, is the study of observable facts and an ongoing conversation about how those facts can be best linked together. Chemical reactions like those proposed by Darwin and Oparin are not expected to leave an observable fossil record without either having fossils to examine or a time machine to travel back and observe what happened, how could scientists even begin to study the origin of life? In the 1950s, Stanley Miller, then a graduate student at the University of Chicago, came up with an idea. We could simulate early Earth conditions in the lab and then carefully watch what happens. If you can't study fish in the sea, set up an aquarium. Working with this professor, Harold Urey, Miller designed an apparatus to simulate the ancient water cycle. Together they put in water to model the ancient ocean. It was gently boiled to mimic evaporation. Along with water vapor, for gases of the atmosphere they chose methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. These are simple gases which scientists at the time thought were probably abundant on the ancient Earth. They added a condenser to cool the atmosphere allowing water molecules to form drops and fall back into their ocean like rain. The ancient Earth would have had many sources of energy, sunlight, geothermal heat, and even thunderstorms, so they added sparks to the atmosphere to simulate lightning. The goal of the experiment was not to create life, 
but to simply test the first step in Oparin's model. Can simple chemistry naturally give rise to the complex molecules of life? After running the experiment for just one week, their ocean became brownish black. Careful analysis revealed that through a series of reactions, many complex molecules had been produced. Among these were amino acids, special molecules of life that we once thought could only be built inside the bodies of living creatures. This was a pivotal breakthrough in science, so significant in fact, that it gave rise to an entirely new field of research now known as prebiotic chemistry. Scientists don't know for sure if the gases used by Miller really were the most common gases of the ancient Earth. Because of this, many experiments have since been done, showing that the molecules of life can form in a wide variety of environments with different starting chemicals and different sources of energy. Sugars, lipids, and amino acids have even been found on meteorites. This suggests that the molecules of life formed all throughout the ancient solar system and maybe forming right now in other regions of our galaxy. Together, these discoveries tell us that Oparin's primordial soup and Darwin's warm little pond could have easily existed in one way or another on our ancient planet. So to sum things up, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? The Miller-Urey experiment was our first attempt at simulating ancient Earth conditions, in this case, the ancient Earth's water cycle, for the purpose of testing ideas about the origin of life. The Miller-Urey experiment is significant for two main reasons. First, though it was not a perfect simulation of the early Earth, it clearly demonstrated for the first time that biomolecules can form under ancient Earth-like conditions. Second, the experiment took what was once mere speculation, the idea that life may have emerged from chemistry, and transformed a portion of that speculation into legitimate, testable science. Many questions remain to be answered about the origin of life, but scientists from many nations and many fields of study are now following Stanley Miller's lead. They're finding ways to turn those questions about the origin of life into testable, scientific hypotheses. Simulation experiments cannot tell us exactly how life formed in the past, but if enough of them are done, they could eventually tell us if it's possible for life to emerge from chemistry. I'm John Perry, and that's the Miller-Urey experiment stated clearly. This video was funded by the Center for Chemical Evolution, the National Science Foundation, and NASA. Special thanks to chemist Eric Parker. He volunteered our So cells evolved, right? Because the early environment on the early Earth was not conducive to life. So we start off with, as soon as life does become a thing on Earth, we start off with these heterotrophic anaerobic prokaryotes. That sounds like a lot. And the asynchronous assignment for today was, is really going to help explain to you all what that means. Those cells then evolved to be able to do photosynthesis, which means that they used carbon dioxide that was already in the atmosphere to start making glucose, to make their own food. So now they become photosynthetic autotrophic prokaryotes. Instead of having to live off of the abiotic organic material, the non-living organic material that was present in the water, 
now they can use energy from the sunlight to make their own food. They don't have to rely on that, uh, that seafood. <laughs> but again, I say seafood, but they, it wasn't living. It was basically just molecules in the ocean. After that, they began to release oxygen into the atmosphere. That oxygen was poisonous to most of, most, of the, most of the life that was in the ocean. So in fact, it killed off most of them, but some of them developed this ability to do aerobic respiration. They use oxygen to make ATP. They use oxygen and glucose to make ATP. Eventually, now we're talking about billions of years. We're not talking about eventually in terms of years or millennia or decades. We're talking about this in terms of billions of years. Eventually, they de develop the ability to specialize and they become multicellular organisms. All right, so when you're done writing that down, you are good to head into the asynchronous assignment for the day. Now, I do want you to start with the, I do want you to start with the, um, with the assignment about, let me see what it's called. I do want you to start with the evolution of cells reading and questions assignment. I'm still working on the review work assignment, but I will notify you when I'm done. So start with the evolution reading and questions.
Thank <clears throat> you.
Okay, it is now 120, so you are good to go. You do have those two asynchronous assignments. I will send out a remind message tomorrow because we do not have school. So it's an ample opportunity for you all to get caught up. Um, I will send out that remind message and okay. uh, give you guys an opportunity to work on it. Okay, have a good day. Okay.